1492, year of discovery, year of controversy. Columbus Day. When you think of Columbus Day in modern times, you may envision closed banks, a day off from school, empty mailboxes, or perhaps a reason to check out the sales at the local mall. As school children, many Americans are taught that Columbus was the courageous admiral of the fleet that discovered America. The brave man from Genoa, whom we can all look to as a national hero. But there is something else which cannot be excluded from an honest discussion of Columbus. Controversy. Debate. Was Columbus a hero, as some would have us believe? Or a murderer, guilty of genocide, some called the American Holocaust? 1992 was to mark the 500th anniversary of Columbus's landing in the New World. Italian-American organizers, community members, and politicians such as Congressman Rodino look forward to the coming event with pride. A bill Rodino co-sponsored, which established the Columbus Quincentenary Jubilee Commission, was signed into public law in 1984. Similar commissions were developed in about 40 different nations across the globe. The purpose of these was to aid in the planning of events for celebrating the legacy of Columbus and the freedom of the Western world. In his Columbus Day Address on October 10, 1991, George Bush Sr. said, For half a millennium, what Columbus discovered has helped chart the course of exploration and opportunity, sailing freedom ship to every corner of the earth. Worldwide, billions of dollars were spent on parades, exhibitions, fireworks, a fleet of over 2,000 ships, and memorials, including a $70 million lighthouse constructed in the Dominican Republic. A poem we published in an anthology dedicated to the quincentennial reads, All hail Columbus, discoverer, dreamer, hero, and apostle. Continents are his monuments, and unnumbered millions present and to come, who enjoy in their liberties and their happiness, the fruits of his faith, will reverently guard and preserve, from century to century, his name and fame. But at the same time that some prepared to guard and preserve Columbus's name and fame, others prepared to protest. In 1990, in Quito, Ecuador, leaders from many Native American nations planned the first intercontinental gathering of Native peoples to mobilize against the glorification of the Columbus Conquest. Native Americans, and what some called historical revisionists, challenged the long-held beliefs of Columbus as a hero. Columbus didn't discover America, they said. He invaded it. William Katz, historian and writer of the American Holocaust, sums up these views. You can't discover a land that has 75 million people on it any more than you and I can get in this ship and sail to Italy or Spain or France or Russia and claim we discovered it today. Michael S. Berliner published his article, The Columbus Debate, many times before and during 1992, and it shows us his side of the issue. Did Columbus discover America? Yes, in every important respect. Columbus brought America to the attention of the civilized world. The result, ultimately, was the United States of America. Russell Means called those racist assumptions and said that it discredited the indigenous people's contributions to the world. Protests of thousands across the globe made headlines. Alternative celebrations were successfully carried out, and the scheduled lighthouse celebration in the Dominican Republic was called off after three days of violent protest. Pro-Columbus scholar John Eadsmo said that cynical humanism was destroying all our national heroes and was actually an attack on Christianity and Western civilization. Michael Berliner said that anti-Columbus Day activists were asking for multiculturalism when it was not deserved. He argued that we should honor Columbus and Western civilization because it was the objectively superior culture. These statements, made in 1992, were not new. The part of the debate which argued that Native people were morally unequal and that Western civilization was superior had been raging for centuries. In order to examine this, we must embark on a journey of our own, back to where it all started. The year was 1492. On the morning of October 12th, Columbus and his men finally spotted land after a long, rough journey at sea. The Tayano, a peaceful people, native to the beautiful island, came to greet him, bringing gifts. 
Columbus wrote of them. They willingly traded everything they owned. They were well built with good bodies and handsome features. He felt they would make good slaves and wrote to his king. Let us, in the name of the Holy Trinity, go on sending all the slaves that can be sold. Slavery began quickly, and Spanish men, eager to make their fortune, arrived in the new lands. Columbus bragged that for one Spanish coin, you could buy a woman or a farm. The sale of nine to ten-year-old girls, he said, was high in demand. In order to obtain gold, Columbus instituted a quota for those Native Americans 14 years of age and older to meet. If they did not, Columbus ordered their hands to be cut off, and many of them bled to death. Las Casas, a Spanish priest who returned with Columbus on his second voyage, described the events that unfolded in his book, The Devastation of the Indies. They were killed by sword, by fire, by being torn to pieces by fierce dogs kept by the Spaniards, and by being tortured to death in various ways. Spaniards would sneak into villages at night and burn families alive while they slept. Nobles of tribes were tricked into celebrating with the Spanish at parties. Then they were slaughtered. Las Casas lamented that to escape this treatment, whole families hanged themselves. But some felt this treatment was just, and in 1550, Sepulveda debated Las Casas because he felt that native people had natural inferiority and were born natural slaves. He felt that military conquest was the best option. Las Casas argued that no one has natural superiority over anyone else, and that Sepulveda should have consulted people who lived among the natives to find out about their well-developed cities, art, and customs. The winner of the debate wasn't conclusive, though it resulted in the eventual end of Native American slavery, but it would come too late for millions of natives who had been killed by destruction or disease. Native Americans feel that this painful legacy of Columbus has been written out of history. In trying to figure out the origins of Columbus Day as a national holiday, we interviewed a history professor from Seton Hall. The first time that there was a big parade and a national holiday was in 1892, 400 years after Columbus sailed, and that took place in New York City. And uh, at that point, President Benjamin Harrison decided that this would be an appropriate holiday to celebrate the advent of public education, free schooling in this country. This march was meant to be a unifying celebration, and Native American children from the Carlisle Indian School were included. But the Carlisle Indian School has a troubling story to tell. Lieutenant Pratt, the school's founder, had a saying, Kill the Indian, not the man. Native American children's names were changed and they forbade them to speak in their own language or practice their own customs and religion. Italian Americans were also discriminated against in the U.S. They were required to register as enemy aliens and even were put into internment camps during World War II. Assimilation to the Protestant religion was pushed, along with name changing and abandoning their native language. Columbus became important to these immigrants, including Congressman Rodino. As archivist Diane Oster from Seton Hall Law Library explained, Columbus at the time stood for pro-immigration rights. Rodina wanted to make sure that immigrants were honored and the man Christopher Columbus was honored as the first um, immigrant, if you will, to the United States. She pointed us to the hearings from the Judiciary Committee for the Monday Holiday Bill, where Rodino testifies. He states, the observance of Columbus Day as a national holiday will, I am certain, prove to be effective in blotting out the vestiges of discrimination, prejudice, and bigotry. And for this reason alone, I would urge favorable action on the pending bill. Favorable action did come, and Lyndon B. Johnson signed the public holiday bill into law with a pen like this one in 1968. The reasons behind Italian-American involvement in the holiday, then, is clear. They wanted to escape prejudice, bigotry, and discrimination, and take their rightful place in American history. This sounded a lot like the wishes of Native American nations. The debate over Columbus's legacy remains unsettled today. No matter which perspective you may hold, it is clear that it's America who will keep on discovering Columbus.